Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? The Red River Institute, johnjdwyer.com, me, Gwen Falconer Lippert, and our signature sponsor, Atwoods, present Oklahoma Gold. Together with award-winning author and historian, John J. Dwyer, we'll stitch the golden threads of Oklahoma history. Here now on Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history through the stories we tell. Bob Kerr's flood of conviction? John J. Dwyer, what's this story? Well, Gwen, today we're going to explore perhaps the greatest feat in the long and historic career of one of the most remarkable Oklahomans ever, Senator Robert S. Kerr. Well, we're going to feature the life story of this larger-than-life giant of mid-20th century American history in another program. But today, we're going to explore a decades-long saga of the impossible becoming real through vision, persistence, and Oklahoma grit. It's one of those stories every Oklahoman, especially every Oklahoma school child, should know, and yet not one in 10,000 of us do. To tell it, we need to go back to May 1943, a life with World War II raging across the earth, and a world in which successive week-long deluges had devastated eastern Oklahoma. The floods swept crops, topsoil, bridges, homes, business, livestock, and people before it. It catapulted the Arkansas River over its banks at Muskogee, washed out 500 square miles of land, killed 26 people, and wrought a half a billion dollars worth of destruction in 2020's currency. Eastern Oklahoma had floods? That's right. Uh, And that's part of the, the moral, I guess, of this story is that we don't think about that now, right? Oklahoma Planning and Resources Board Director Don McBride wrote Robert S. Kerr, then the brand-new Oklahoma governor, an impassioned appeal. He urged long-term flood planning to prevent a repeat disaster. During the ravaged area by air, Kerr came to consider the disaster his flood of conviction. He recognized in his unique way an opportunity to help both the state of Oklahoma and himself. Here was a ready-made issue which no one in politics was using, he said. Thus began Big Bob Kerr's mighty crusade to leverage the economic and political might of the United States for the improvement of one of its most benighted areas, eastern Oklahoma. The 30-year quest and the sprawling host of adversaries well illustrate both the rough-and-tumble nature of politics and the personal attributes that lifted Kerr to national power and lasting fame in Oklahoma. He first perceived the need for allies and the need to provide incentives for others to become allies. He began to cultivate friendships with U.S. Army Corps of Engineer officers and to learn of their own challenges, constraints, and hopes. He brought together Oklahoma's two greatest but squabbling proponents of Arkansas River Basin development, and he persuaded them to combine their considerable influences. This enabled the comprehensive strategy that would include both small and large dams, watershed improvement, soil conservation, flood control, power generation, and navigation. And somewhere along the way, Gwen, Kerr envisioned the potential for parlaying all of this into an unprecedented outdoor recreational area. That's a lot more familiar now in eastern Oklahoma than flooding. Well, all through the 1950s, though, his obsession to deliver flood-prone, economically struggling eastern Oklahoma, a game-changing complex of Arkansas River Basin Enterprises mounted. While still governor, Kerr had observed Congress pass the Flood Control Act of 1946. It green-lighted major dam projects across America. A subsequent 1948 act even did so in both the Arkansas and Red River basins in Oklahoma. But, as recalled by legendary Oklahoma Congressman Carl Albert, all of these enterprises were worse than nothing at all for the state. The dams were purely for downstream flood control, Albert recalled, almost all of it in Arkansas and Louisiana. In Oklahoma, they would back up floodwaters for miles, only spreading the flood's damages, end quote. Well, as memorably chronicled by Ann Hodges Morgan in Robert S. Kerr, The Senate Years, Kerr first girded support for his Arkansas River Basin development project quest from close to home. 
successively by persuading all of them of the potential benefits to them. He secured the backing of Oklahoma City business leaders, Western Oklahoma and Kansas leaders, and Arkansas politicians. Giant adversaries lingered at every stage, however, not least Oklahoma's Congressman Mike Monroney and Arkansas Senator John McClellan. Kerr took his obsession, as Carl Albert called it, into the United States Senate from his first day there. When Congress initially stonewalled his efforts to channel funds into projects that would aid Oklahoma, he maneuvered President Harry Truman into initiating the process that would create the Arkansas White Red Basin Interagency Committee. That's a long word, but what that meant was Oklahoma now had a federal entity to operate through. New roadblocks arose, however. The Korean War slammed progress to a virtual halt for its 1950-53 to 53 duration. Also, newly elected Republican President Dwight Eisenhower's desire to streamline the federal budget and provide relief to the American taxpayer created a new hurdle for river development. Other senators, meanwhile, wanted their own river projects funded. And Kerr's fellow Oklahoma senator, Elmer Thomas, a powerful river project ally, was defeated by none other than Congressman Mike Monroney. That Oklahoma City native declared his convictions on the matter. You could pave the Arkansas River cheaper than you could navigate it. Well, these long years of frustration included repeated delays and rejections in both houses of Congress of funds and considerations for Kerr's project. These would doubtless have drained almost any man besides Kerr of his determination and belief in a vast project for flood control, water use, recreation, hydroelectric power, even ocean-bound navigation, as Carl Albert saw it. But Big Bob used these audacious objectives to build support from his strategically chosen position on the Public Works Subcommittee, which had jurisdiction over river projects. You think he played the long game? Yes, he did. In addition, he wanted to craft a financial plan wherein the proposal would not only pay for itself, but also generate millions of dollars in revenue, spoken like a good American capitalist. He aimed with his unbeatable determination, even when it seemed hopeless, perhaps even nonsensical, to outlast his many opponents. Well, by 1955, Kerr had tired of his fellow Oklahoma Senator Monroney's opposition. He tried for years to win his support. Now he unleashed powerful Oklahoma rancher Joe Jarbo to inform Monroney that, quote, his continued opposition to the Arkansas would lead to a gigantic and well-financed effort to unseat him in 1956, end quote. Monroney ceased his opposition, and Kerr won the powerful Arkansas Senator John McClellan's support. Following his re-election, Kerr took the chairmanship of the Public Works Subcommittee on Rivers, Harbors, and Flood Control in 1955. Backed by the new Democratic Party majority, he now had the final word over what river projects won approval and funding. But Gwen, Robert Kerr's greatest challenges yet on the presidential level awaited him. I bet the golden nugget is going to be all of the great things we take for granted today that are part of this project. Now that's Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history by the stories we learn. And I think this one takes Oklahoma all the way to the Mississippi River. John J. Dwyer? It does, Gwen. And we told at the first half of the program why Bob Kerr got that flood of conviction. Now we're going to tell what he did about it. Through the years, his Arkansas River Navigation Plan gathered specific projects and funding through a U.S. House where he developed many key allies, and a U.S. Senate, where he gradually built a power base, him being a senator, that would become virtually invincible by the beginning of his third term. A key to moving his own river project forward was by packaging it with others, championed by other key senators. Bit by bit, vote by vote, Kerr's support engine had gathered steam and momentum for a full decade. Then it crashed into its final serious foe, President Eisenhower. Kerr recognized and sympathized with Ike's honorable intentions to stem escalating federal spending. 
but a battle royale commenced between these two American giants over the Arkansas River Navigation System, or ARNS. Kerr relentlessly pursued it, while Eisenhower vetoed four different spending bills between 1956 and 1959 that torpedoed the funding needed to move the ARNS forward in any significant fashion. By the fourth time, Kerr chaired and probably conceived the new Select Committee on National Water Resources. He crafted so much flood control and water development project support in Republican legislators' areas that many of them took his side against their own president. Eisenhower had vetoed 145 bills during his seven years in office. Not once had the Senate overridden him with the necessary two-thirds majority. They did so on number 146, which would have denied Bob Kerr the arms funding he needed that fourth time. But one final unexpected funding logjam confronted Senator Bob Kerr in the early 1960s. You see, we began in 1943, now we're 20 years later. As he tried to carry his historic Arkansas River plan across the goal line to final congressional approval, when President John F. Kennedy, a political ally, appealed to Kerr for his muscle in passing the president's historic Reagan-esque 1962 personal and corporate income tax cut, Kerr said he couldn't help until Kennedy broke the arms funding tangle. You know, Bob, JFK responded with his winning smile, I never really understood that Arkansas River bill before today. Well, Kennedy got the American people a treasured tax cut, and Kerr got Oklahomans the Arkansas River navigation system. By September 1962, tens of millions of dollars were flowing into the project. Dams had been completed, and the port of Muskogee was opened. Ironically, though, more money poured into the project after Kerr's stunning 1963 death than before. Years later, when President Richard Nixon opened it in 1971 and it extended all the way to the Mississippi, the McClellan Kerr Arkansas River Navigation System, or MCARNS, had the largest price tag of any waterway in history $1.2 billion. It connected northeast Oklahoma with the Gulf of Mexico and the Mississippi River. It spawned 18 locks and dams, five of them in Oklahoma. And MCARN's leaders ingeniously created several upstream Oklahoma lakes and reservoirs. They wove seven of them into the MCARN's for flood control and support of the locks and dams. These included the existing Grand Lake of the Cherokees and Fort Gibson, and man made MCARN's inspired Keystone, Ulaga, Tinkiller, Hudson, and the state's largest lake, Eufaula. The system generated Oklahoma inland seaports at Muskogee and Catoosa. Both towns developed expansive port and industrial districts that now employ thousands of workers. Catoosa is the second farthest inland port in America. Then in 2015, the Corps of Engineers promoted the MCARNS as a high-use waterway system. This certified that Bob Kerr's flood of conviction had become over 10 million tons of crude oil, coal, steel, wheat, and other raw products and cargo passing through it each year, inbound and out, with a value of more than 12 million ton miles annually. The system has also preserved Oklahoma from billions of dollars in flood ruin, generated hydroelectric power for the entire region, and triggered a growing surge of recreational activities and home building. Future U.S. House Speaker Carl Albert memorably recalled his final fellowship with Kerr the day before the 1962 elections and less than two months before Kerr's death. After a round of speeches, Albert recalled, Bob Kerr and I drove onto the bridge that crossed the Arkansas, and he stopped the car. As we both got out, he talked about the river's future and said to me, If anything should happen to me, I hope you will finish this project for me. You're the only one I know that can do it. We climbed back into the car and drove on over to Spiral, where Kerr gave a ringing speech about Oklahoma, its rivers, and its future. Closing, he shouted, Let's all sing, shall we gather at the river? We must have sung it a dozen times, each with the fervor of a brush arbor revival. We liked doing it so much we did the same thing at Poto, the stop that finished the day's campaign. The words were ringing in my ears when Bob Kerr and I shook hands and promised to meet in Washington when the 1963 session opened. I never saw him again. We finished that project, though. 
with the other water projects that did indeed transform Oklahoma's environment. It made unbearable dust and uncontrollable floods part of our history, a modern life part of our future. By then, the man who had done the most to create that future was gathered with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Bob Kerr. Now that's Oklahoma Gold.